Okay, we are working on our study on the parables, and I think we're up to number 13. And to be co completely honest with you, I did not realize how many parables there were until I started this study. I had no idea that there were that many of them, but there, but there are, and we'll just keep trying to make some headway uh, on these today. This next parable is found over in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. And it shows the sovereignty of God in distributing recompenses to those who serve him. Matthew 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came... When they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that, that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last for many be called, but few chosen. So this parable shows that God is sovereign when it comes to giving recompenses to those that labor in his field, if you will, to those that serve him. God makes the decisions on what the reward is because it's God's creation. And that's something we, we can't lose sight of. We tend to. But we can't. We have to remember that God's in ultimate control here. He's the one we serve. Now, this is another parable describing the kingdom of heaven. And as I went in detail last week to explain how it is that some of these parables deal with the kingdom of heaven, the church, as opposed to the kingdom of heaven in heaven, I'm not going to take the time to do that again. That was on last week's sermon. So if you need a refresher, go back and take a listen to that. It was right in the very beginning of it. But this, de this is dealing with the church. This is dealing with people that labor in the church. Okay? And the occasion of this parable, or the reason that it was given, was because of Peter's question concerning what he and the other disciples would have for forsaking all and following Christ. This is found in Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, which is just in front of this. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? In other words, what do we get out of this? I'm sorry, that's kind of a rude question, I think. I don't, I don't think that I would have the nerve to walk up to God and say, hey, what do I get out of this if I serve you? What do I get? What's, I, I wouldn't do that to my own dad, let alone 
the Lord Jesus, I don't, I, but Peter, you know, that was Peter. He didn't seem to have a problem with it. So this is what Jesus answered him. Um, now, in this parable, men were called at various times throughout the day to labor in the householder's vineyard, which shows that men should labor. God expects us to work. If you're able to work, God expects you to do it. In fact, we're told over in Timothy that if a man doesn't provide for his own, that he's worse than an infidel and is denied the faith. We are to work. God prefers us to labor rather than just stand around idle. It also says that the men that were hired later in the day were hired with only the promise that they would receive whatever is right. The men at the beginning were told what they would receive. The later men were just told that they would receive whatever is right. And really, anything that these laborers might earn would be better than standing idle and earning nothing, right? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, we see that God's kingdom, the church, is like a vineyard. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to have to do a little chasing to see it, but it's there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Now this was written to a church. Members of a church. The church at Corinth. And so the we that are laborers are the members of that church. We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. That word husbandry is translated from a Greek word that means cultivable area or farm. So it's like a vineyard, right? A vineyard is a farm for grapes. So that's how the church is likened. Um, and we're we're called laborers in uh, numerous passages. Look at uh, Romans chapter 16. And verse 12. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Paris which labored much in the Lord. These are church members that labored. So you see, this is not just talking about pastors. This is talking about church members. You are laborers in the Lord. What you do down here is, is like working in a vineyard. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58... Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Lord will reward you for the labor that you, that you do for him while you're down here. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10 Hebrews 6.10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. So we are considered laborers in God's vineyard. Now in the parable at the end of the day, the laborers were called to receive their hire from the beginning, uh, from the last unto the first. They received their pay when they were called. In like manner, we receive reward from God in God's time, not our time. And that's something that we have to remember. Sometimes we don't get things as fast as we think we ought to get them. We don't get them, folks, until the end of the day when it's time to get the pay. 
These laborers also received the same rate, wage regardless of how long they worked. It didn't matter if they worked one hour or if they worked 12 hours, which is an interesting note, isn't it? In the Bible, a day is 12, 12 hours long. God expects you to work 12 hours. Not four of them are overtime either. That was the way things used to be back in the old days. You, I know my father being a farmer, he worked from just before sunup until just before sundown. However many hours that was didn't matter. I don't think they paid attention to a clock back in those days. The sun was up, you work while the sun's up. Now, <clears throat> those that labored all day complained that those who had labored but, but just for one hour were made equal to them. They didn't murmur because they didn't get enough. It wasn't because they didn't feel they got paid enough. They murmured because others who had worked less were made equal to them. That bothered them. In James chapter 4 and verse 5 it says, Do you think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that, that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? See, one of the problems is they were lusting after what those other people had. And that's described as envious. And if unchecked, because of our fallen nature, we have a tendency to undervalue God's goodness to us while we resent his goodness to others. That's something that we've got to keep in check, folks. And that's just part of what comes along with having been, been born with Adam as a father. But it's something that we have to keep in mind. This parable teaches us not to be proud of what we do more than others and not to think God's more indebted to us because of it. He's not. And it should check any pride that these apostles might have developed because here they had left all to follow Christ. Granted, they left all to follow Christ, but you know what they got? They got to follow Christ. They lived with God manifest on the, in the flesh on this earth for three and a half years. None of us got that. So there's pluses and minuses in, whoever, in whichever situation you might be in. You think about Paul. He was nothing behind the very chiefest of, of apostles, and yet he confessed that he was nothing and less than the least of all the saints. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11. And this is the attitude that we should have as well. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 11. I'm getting better. I was in 1 Corinthians, at least I didn't start reading. <laughs> Second Corinthians 12. I have become a fool in glory and ye have compelled me for I ought to have been commended of you for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles Though I be nothing. And look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8. Ephesians 3, 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So here the man that was not a wit behind the very chiefest of the apostles considered himself nothing and less than the least of the saints. And that's an attitude that we should have. Besides that, you know what? Nobody's wronged if you receive exactly what you agreed for, right? If you go apply for a job and they ask you what your salary demands are and you tell them and they agree to it, you really don't have a right to complain if somebody next to you is making more. You agreed for the, judge, for the wage, right?
This parable also teaches that it's lawful for one to do what he uh, to to do what he will with his own. You see, hired servants don't have the right to dictate how their master should dispense his, their wealth. I don't have the right to tell my boss how he goes about spending his money. You don't have the right to do that either. And since God owns all, God can give whatever he will to whomever he will, whenever he will. And it's not our right to complain about it. It then says, is thine eye evil because I am good? You know, envy springs from a resentment of God's goodness. Think about that. You become envious of someone else because of something about that person or something that that person has. Well, God was good to that person, so you're envious of of someone because God was good to him? Does that make sense? Do you you see? and, And that, folks... Envy is a sin, and having an evil eye is a sin. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 15. You see, the fact is, if someone, if someone benefits somehow and God gives them something, we ought, to, we ought to be thankful for them, rather than to be envious of them. On. Deuteronomy 15 and verse 9. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not. And he cried unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. The, what he's talking about here is that in Israel, if you loaned someone, if you loan someone money, make a loan to someone, well, every seven years you have to forgive the debt. So if it's six months before the Jubilee hits, what Moses is saying, don't sit back and go, you know what, if I give you this, you're not going to pay me back because in six months from now, I got to forgive it, so I'm just not going to give it to you. Don't do that. That's a sin. Okay? But the point I want you to see here is that this, I, this idea of envy, um, that your eye be evil against your poor brother, that, that that's a sin unto you. Look at Luke chapter 11. In verse 34. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body is also full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body is also full of darkness. Over in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 8, we're given a warning that says, Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. So when, when Christ is saying, is, is, is thine eye evil because I am good? Think about that. Envying someone else because of something that God gave them, that's a sin, folks. That's evil. Be happy for them. Don't come down against them because they just happened to get something that maybe you wanted and didn't get. Now, one of the lessons here of this parable, let's get back to it, is that the last shall be first and the first last. Look also, now that's over in Matthew chapter 20. At the end of the parable, verse 16, so the last shall be first and the first last. Look at Matthew chapter 19, 
and verse 30. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. Think about this. The Gentiles who became partakers of the church long, long, long after the Jews were ended up being made equal with the Jews. You see, the last were first and the first last. Look over in Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 19, now therefore ye, Paul, a Jew, speaking to Gentiles in Ephesus, says, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So here, the last became the first. And the first became the last. Because many of the Jews that had long been part of God's congregation on earth at the end will be found that they weren't even children of God to start with. Paul was an apostle who became an apostle long after the other apostles, but he wasn't behind them in any way, shape, or form. And if God blesses a new young minister to build more churches than an old minister, well, God has the right to do that. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna chase a rabbit here for a couple of minutes. Um, this seems like a fitting time to do it. I've been here now for 10 years. So, um, and a lot of you were here when I first started. And, and I'm gonna make a confession for a long time. I lived under the shadow of Elder Conrad Cheryl. And I had that thrown in my face, not so much by folks here, but by others for, for years and years and years and years. Folks, don't ever do that to a man. Don't ever do that. Don't ever compare one pastor with another pastor. Don't do that. That's a horrible thing to do. God's ministers are not all the same. We're not carbon copies of the men that we follow. We were all born in different places at different times with different parents, different upbringings, different circumstances, different experiences. And all of that flavors who we are and how we go about doing things. Also, we're not given the same talents. We saw that last week in the parable of the talents. God gives to the man the talents needed for the place where God has called him to be. So when a specific man might, one man might be a perfect fit for a church where another man might be a horrible fit for that church because of his past experiences and who he is. I remember very early in my pastorate here, a lesson I had to learn. I tried to do things the way my father in the ministry would do them. I would go to him for advice on how to handle a situation. And I'd follow his advice to the letter and it would absolutely blow up in my face. One occasion that I, that I remember I followed his advice to the letter and it triggered Jeremy's mother to the point that she left the room and never came back again. And that cost her her temporal salvation because I didn't do what I should have done, which is be Jim Henderson instead of trying to be Conrad Jarrell. And there's times when I think that maybe the church he served, maybe if he had have held back a little bit and been a little bit more like me, maybe things would have worked out different. But you know what? It's not my call to make. I wasn't the pastor there. He was. So I have to live with the mistakes I make and suffer for them. And he had to live with the mistakes that he made and suffer for them. But we're all different people. Um, now, God's ministers are all given the same office, and they are all due the same respect. And in that area, they're all equal. But we're not to compare one man with another. You look at the church in Corinth, which Paul referred to as babes in Christ. They weren't the most spiritual church. And in one place, he talks about one say, says, I'm of Apollos, and another, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Cephas, comparing one minister with another. 
That's not to be done. That's done by babies in Christ. People should understand that the man that God sends you is the man that God sends you. And that man has been prepared for, for your work. Now, I say this for, for a very specific reason, which I'll get to here in a second. I remember years ago when Pastor Mott turned the Las Vegas church over to Pastor Gerald. He told us at that time that he was no longer our pastor. Um, that we're not to compare what he did as the pastor of the Las Vegas church with what Conrad Gerald would do as the pastor of the church. And what, you know, one of the biggest complaints that I hear from people that have lived here in Florida for a long time, those of us that used to live in Nevada have the same complaint. Um, and I know y'all have heard this and probably y'all agree with it. And that is that people that come here from New Jersey or New York or California or Wisconsin or wherever, they come here to get away from where they came from and then they want to change Florida into the place that they came from. You know, people in churches do the same thing. They leave a church and go to another church and then complain that that church isn't like the one they left. Well, if that's the case, you should, you should have stayed where you were. And sometimes it's the same with a church when there's a change in a minister. And I'll tell you something, you throw up the old pastor to the new guy and you're gonna drive a wedge between you and that pastor that may take years to ever resolve. I am now 70 years of age. And this is why I'm saying this, I'm 70 years old. My sister lived to be 72. My father lived to be almost 74. I've already outlived both of the grandparents on my mother's side. So I'm on borrowed time already, folks. I'm not in the greatest of health. I didn't take very good care of myself when I was young. I don't know how, long, how much longer I've got. I hope I got another 10 years in me, but I don't know that. I could fall over dead tomorrow. I hope that whenever I go, this church is still here. And when this church is still here and I'm not, you're gonna need another pastor. Whatever you do, please do not go to that new pastor and say, well, Pastor Henderson wouldn't have done it that way. Pastor Henderson would have done it this way. Don't do that to that man. Please don't do that to that man. You know what it's, you know what it'd be like? It would be like going to your current spouse and saying, why don't you cook the way my ex-wife did? Hmm, you think that'd go over well? I got news for you, you're sleeping on the couch. So don't do that to a man when he comes along, just don't. Understand that that man, if he was called to that church and ordained to that church, he's the man to follow and just as, as much as you might admire someone else, that's between you and God. Let the man do his job, okay? Now, that had absolutely nothing to do with the sermon, but felt it needed to be said. Now, there's another lesson in here. Back to our parable in Matthew chapter 20. And this is a good one. Matthew chapter 20 at the verse 16. So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Many be called, but few chosen. Chosen. What in the world does that mean? Many be called, but few chosen. Well, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that they're called to life. It doesn't mean that. Over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 30, we see those that have the effectual call to life, but that's only to the elect. Romans chapter 8 
in verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. There's that call. That's the call to life. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. That call is only to the elect. It doesn't, that's, it's not referring to that. This refers to the call of the gospel, which is broad and general. Look at Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's a general call. That affects everybody. You know, there's going to come a day where every knee will bow, regardless of whether they're elect or not. There will come a day when everyone will repent, not that it will do them any good. But that day will come on judgment day. But the gospel goes out to everybody. We call on everybody to repent. It's just that we realize that most of them aren't gonna because only the elect will, at least in this life. So that's the general call. And many, many who are called by the gospel Refuse it. Look at Proverbs chapter 1. Verses 24 and 25. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. You see, most people, they won't have anything to do with it. They hear the message, but they repel from it. But in, rela in relation to the many that are called, there are few that are actually God's elect. There are few that are actually chosen. So we preach to, the, to everybody, and some respond, and most don't. Many are called but few are chosen. Okay, now let's go to parable number 14, which is the parable of the unprofitable servant. This is found over in Luke chapter 17. Seems like I picked a day of really hard parables for folks. Luke 17, 7 through 10. But which of you, <coughs> excuse me, which of you having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things, which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that, which was our duty to do. Now this term by and by means um, straightway or immediately, right now. Let's compare a couple of passages to see that. Look at Matthew chapter 13. And verse 21, we're talking about a parable that we've already looked at. Um, 
the parable of the sower, and it says in verse 21, Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Now, let's compare that by and by to a parallel passage over in Mark, talking about the same parable in Mark chapter 4 and verse 17. And have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. You see, by and by and immediately go hand in hand. So when you see that that word by and by, it's not talking about someday off in the future. It's right now. It's immediately. So back in our parable again, Luke 17, verse 7. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, by and by? No, when, say to him immediately when he has come from the field. Now, notice this servant doesn't eat and drink immediately after his plowing or feeding the cattle. I got a feeling he's probably hungry after being out there all day. That's not his job. His job is to take care of his master first, and then he can go eat. But first, you serve the master. That's the lesson of the parable, that our service should come first. In the same manner, God's service ought to have priority over us serving ourselves. And one of the things, you know, we, we can't cease serving the Lord because he has not yet recompensed us. Because we haven't received anything yet. As we saw in the last parable, we will receive reward on God's time. When he's ready, he'll give it to us. Um, give, let me give you an example. You might see a commandment. And so you think, okay, well, I'll keep this commandment. And so you do, but then you don't receive anything. And so you start to think, well, it didn't work. So you quit. So you give up. Well, maybe it didn't work yet, but God doesn't sometimes do things when you want him to do them. He does them when... He's ready to do them. So you keep the commandment, even though you may not receive instant gratification. Now, I understand that generations today think that gratification should be here immediately. But God's not a millennial, folks. He doesn't work on those rules. And he rewards people when he wants to reward people. It's your duty as born-again children of God, as children who Christ died on the cross for, who, as children who God elected to save you. It's your duty to keep God's commandments regardless of whether you ever receive what you think you ought to receive or not. It doesn't matter. You're still unprofitable servants as far as as God is saying, you, you say, well, well, that's kind of an insult um, to say that we're unprofitable. I'll explain that to you in just a minute. But obedience to all of God's commandments is something that we owe him. We owe him that much. And you know what his, you know what his commandments are? They are commandments. They are not guidelines. They are not suggestions, they're commandments. And at the point that you decide not to comply with one or more of his commandments, that's the point where you'll stop growing in faith, you will stop growing in grace, 
you will stop growing in knowledge and you will stop growing in understanding. When you get to the point that you say, that's it, I'm not going any farther, you just flushed your relationship with God down the toilet. That's simple. So if that's important to you, you keep the commandments. So when you see something in God's word that you, you know that's what it says, and you're to do it, then do it. And you'll continue to grow. If you don't, you'll end up cutting yourself off at the knees. And eventually, when you, when you decide you've gone as far as you're going to go, eventually you'll lose everything that God's given to you. You'll lose all your understanding. You'll lose, you'll lose it all. I have met people that knew this book better than I, than I do that have lost every bit of it and they're back to being Indians again because they quit doing what God told them to do. Mary Del Gero used to say, it's like God gives them a stupid pill. And it is, it's, it's incredible to watch. You'll watch somebody that knows exactly what's going and then all of a sudden they just, they just become stupid. Why? because they wouldn't do what God told them to do and they knew there was something there they were to do and they didn't do it. They dug in their heels and they lost it all. And even when we keep his commandments, we're to confess ourselves as nothing but unprofitable servants. Why do I say that? Because God doesn't gain anything by virtue of your service. You can't make him any more perfect than he already is. Nothing that we can do can add to the perfection of God. And I realize that there's a, you know, there's a lot of preachers out there that think that God needs them in order to populate heaven. That's what they really believe. They believe that without them out there preaching the gospel, then God will be a failure. And Christ will walk around the the rim of hell crying over all of those that could have been in heaven but weren't. Nothing could be further from the truth, folks. God's not a failure. And it's not up to us to do that. That is the height of arrogance and pride and ego. And those are three things that God actually hates. And I would suggest that they're pro- these guys are probably in for a very rude awakening about three seconds after they close their eyes in death. I think they're going to be shocked, regardless of where they show up. I think they're going to be shocked. Folks, any, and I repeat, any reward that gives us for our service is not because our service deserves it. It's because God has promised to give it to us. And he's faithful to his promises. We looked at this passage already today, but let's look at it again. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. Hebrews 6 and verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. <clears throat> Just remember something. God doesn't owe you anything. And you owe God everything. Okay? Now, let's try to find a happier. How about the parable of the unjust judge? Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Luke 18, 1 through 8. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord 
and said, hear what the unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? So the parable of the unjust judge teaches us to persevere in prayer. Notice what this lady did. She asked, over and 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 over again. I had a son that used to do that to me. He's not in the room right now. <laughs> but he would drive me absolutely out of my mind. But that's exactly how we're supposed to approach God. You ask him for something, you don't get the answer right away. Well, don't give up. Ask him again. Just bug him to death until he finally relents. We're told that if it's in agreement with, with, with the scriptures, he's going to give it to you. So beg him for it. Don't just ask him once. Just ask over and over and over and over. Because if an unjust judge will finally give in, don't you think God will? So that's the lesson to learn from this. And the parable was spoken to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. The word faint means to lose heart or courage, to be afraid, to become depressed, to give way. So don't faint. Just hang in there and keep asking over and over and over and over again. The answer, it may not, don't just assume that the answer is no because you didn't get a yes right away. The answer might be maybe, or the answer might be, I'll get back to you later, I'm busy right now. But he'll get back to you. And notice that a consistent prayer life goes along with retaining heart and courage. The parable teaches that we do not always get what we pray for right away. If a judge who neither fears God nor regards man, he's, he, that's the unjust judge. And this widow would not leave that judge alone until he granted her petition. If such importunity would move an unjust judge to grant a request, how much more shall the cries of God's elect be heard? But don't just ask once and give up. Ask over and over and over and over and over again. Put it on the list and keep it on the list. <clears throat> Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Look at, turn to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Where Paul says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Go boldly and go often and just keep asking. And remember, she had no advocate. We do. We have an advocate. Look at 1 John chapter 2. In verse 1, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We've got somebody right there to speak in his ear for us.
And interestingly enough, this continual coming finally wearied the judge. Do you know that's exactly what God wants, though? It pleases him when his children come to him and ask him for things and keep asking. That pleases him. He delights in that. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. In verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, always praying always, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. See, the point is to be in prayer constantly. Well, you only have so many things to ask. If you're going to be in prayer constantly, what are you going to be asking? The same stuff. Over and over and over again. If you only have six items to pray for, but you're going to be praying constantly, you're going to be asking for those six items over and over and over and over again. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17 where it says, pray without ceasing. Now continual prayer to God is an effective recourse against our adversaries. And when God gets around to answering, we're told in this, in this parable, it says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. When he gets around to answering, it happens quick. Hebrews chapter 10. In verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Keep asking. Eventually you'll get your answer. And when you get it, it'll happen so fast your head will spin. And you know what else? This type of important important prayer is an evidence of faith. If you have faith, you pray. And if you pray all the time, it's an evidence of more faith. And the more you pray, the more faith you have, and on and on it goes. It then says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? That's the last sentence of our parable here. Which tells us that Christ is not going to return to a Christianized world, not how it's going to be. Shall I even find faith? Will there even be anyone left that has the true faith when he returns? That's the point. the, The fact is that the truth and true churches will be almost extinct at the time of the second coming. Look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9. Revelation 20, verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints. There's a church. A camp is a temporary dwelling place. The church is a temporary dwelling place on earth for God's children. The camp of the saints and the beloved city, and that beloved city, as I've taught before, is another term for the church. 
and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Just before the end, Satan will have almost extinguished the true church on planet Earth. He may be down to one or two congregations. Look around now. How many of them are left? At one time, the southern United States was full of churches that teach exactly what we teach today. And look at it now. Those that have the name of the denomination, they don't teach this anymore for the most part. None of them in Lakeland do. I mean, they've, they've all got musical instruments and they're progressives. Things have gotten to the point where, where how many of them are left? A handful? And it's just going to get worse and worse until the end, until Christ returns. True faith will be reduced to such negligible proportions as to be scarcely, scarcely present at all. Look at Second Thessalonians. Chapter 2 and verse 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that's the second coming, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So all indications are that shortly before the second coming, God will finally remove the restraints and will allow Satan to put his one world government system back together again. Now, you know, one of the things we bemoan is the fact that it looks like we're heading that, in that direction because of a lot of the things that go on here in this country. Do you not understand that that's gotta happen? Do you not see the fact that that has to happen? If there's going to be a one world government, there has to be, it's got to get there in order for all of this stuff to happen. Someday, whether it's in our lifetime or not, it's going to happen. There's going to be a one world government. If you have a one girl world, think about this for a minute. You've got people like George Soros, who that's his main, his main um, objection or main object is to put together a one world empire that he can rule over. He's been at it ever since he was a kid. He's the one that doesn't want to have any borders. Well, if it's a one world empire, what do you need borders for? You see, that answers your question as to what goes on at the southern border right now. They don't want a border. They want us to all be one country. They want us to, the, the politicians in Washington aren't content to run the United States. Nancy Pelosi wants to be queen of the world. They, they're not happy with just the US. They want the whole world. They're like pinky in the brain. And they want the entire world. And that's what they're going for. And all of the things they're doing are headed in exactly that direction. Why, why should we be surprised? It's got to happen before Christ returns. That's what the Bible tends to tends to teach us there will come a time when this world will be governed by one person and that one person will be the Antichrist. But he won't be here long and one of his main objections will uh, object, object, one of the main things he wants to do is to destroy this church and churches like it. So that's what we ought to be looking at. And not worry, don't get worried about all the rest of it. That's, it's going to happen. It has to happen. And once that empire is established, then I would assume that our form of religion will be outlawed. It'll come down to the point where we'll be outlaws. And we'll probably have to do what Welsh Baptists had to do for 1,200 years meet here one week and somewhere else the next week and hide out 
which is what they did. You know, the, the Welsh Baptists there for a long time, they, they lived very close to the county line. And so they would jump across the, if this county made a law that you couldn't worship, well, they'd, they'd go jump across the county line into the next county. Kind of like we live, Hillsborough County is not too far from here. So we could jump, we could go meet in Hillsborough County. Well, the, if, if Polk County passed a law, we could go over there. If Hillsborough passes a law, well, we come back over here. Or we go to another county, we, we bounce around, we hide. They did that for years. And we, and we may very well have to do that again. That day may very well come if they put that empire together during our lifetime. Could happen, maybe not. We could be here another 100 years for all I know. But that's something that we have to look to and indication it looks like it's not that far away. But then again, you know, every generation has thought they were the one. I read books from the 1600s and the, and the commentary basically says that they're expecting it any day now because it sure looks like this is the end. Well, it hasn't been yet. Not to say it might not be soon, but it hasn't been yet. Okay, that's enough. So we finished three parables today. Next week we will, uh, Lord willing, we will begin with the parable of the two sons, which was intended to shame the Pharisees and the chief priests for not believing John the Baptist. And then we've got some other parables to follow after that. With that, I thank you for your very kind and patient attention this morning. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.